Okay, so welcome everyone. Uh, we are very glad to, um, to host uh, this um, big picture tonight. Um, very glad to welcome, um, even though virtually, uh, Lorenzo Vituri, Sophie Desrosiers and uh, Natalia Bobadilla. Um, so the Photographic Center proposed here tonight to take a step back on the work of uh, Lorenzo Vituri that we have the pleasure to to host here in the Photographic Center. We have um, uh, had to temporarily close the show because of the sanitary restrictions, uh, but it will open again on December 15. And so we wanted um, to still have this, uh, this talk that we had planned for a long time uh, with two uh, researchers uh, who have a specific um, uh, fields of uh, of uh, research, um, Sophie Desrosiers on the history of textile and uh, Natalia Bobadilla um, on the organizational uh, theory. So um, the aim of, um, of uh, reaching these two uh, researchers and uh, having them discussed with Lorenzo Vittori, of course, beforehand, uh, and, and tonight um, all together was really to, um, to explore some features which are uh, at work and at stage uh, in Lorenzo Vittori uh, work throughout the years because the, the work deals very much with uh, hybridation and um, both um, Sophie and Natalia also explore this uh, thematical uh, link in between their uh, own fields of the textile and uh, the organizational uh, theory. So we're going to um, start first with uh, Sophie Desrosiers, who uh, will propose a talk uh, who's also kind of a conversation in the end with Lorenzo Vittori, uh, who's called All is Métissage. So just for a brief introduction, uh, Sophie is an anthropologist and uh, honorary associate professor at the EHESS, uh, L'Ecole des Hautes Études en Sciences Sociales in Paris, and her research focuses on the long-term history and anthropology of textile in the end, on the one end, and on the other end, in the old world, world with a focus on silks. She has investigated current weaving practices in various communities in the highlands of Bolivia and Peru, and she has been interested in the silks produced in central and northern Italy from the late uh, 12th century. So, of course, these two specific fields of research echoes very much with the um, own roots of, um, of Lorenzo Vittori and what came up recently in his work, because uh, Lorenzo is both um, uh, from origins of uh, Peruvian and uh, Italian. So that was also kind of um, uh, uh, a second um, uh, interest into um, uh, the eco between there's two, uh, the, the two research between uh, Lorenzo and uh, Sophie's researches. So um, Sophie, I will leave you the word. And uh, so this uh, talk is about 45 minutes and uh, then we will have a time also if you want to uh, interact with the um, with, uh, questions, uh, please do. Um, we'll we'll uh, address the questions to, um, to the speakers. And then we'll have uh, the other talk by Natalia. Sophie, please. Okay, thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. And a special greeting to Raphael Stoppin, um, who suggested that I commend the work of uh, Lorenzo Vitturi as uh, his photos are in, exposed in Rouen. And um, uh, I also greet Natalia, whom I meet for the first time. Mm. Uh, we will take over the floor for the second part of this conference. And of course, Lorenzo Vitturi, who, owing to the need to proceed online, has fortunately joined us some problems meet sometimes improved solutions. <laughs> uh, so I won't repeat what uh, Raphael has uh, already said and go through uh, just a few information. I should mention that I had a long telephone call with uh, Lorenzo and had access to several books containing his photos. First of all, the one 
uh, of his project Caminantes of Travelers. From this project, the Rouen exhibition, Nula et Puron, Nothing is Pure, walks us into a strange world which the artist feels is disturbing, bordering on the impure. I will take the opposite tack by joining, by pointing out the many, not so much textile, but rather sensitive uh, metissage, which irrigate many of his works and show what balances the shape to achieve stability. I have constructed my intervention as a letter addressed to Lorenzo Vitulli. I, it ends with a few questions that I hope he will accept to answer. One disclaimer, only some pieces in the PowerPoint are provided with a description because I could access only one file that had such data. Everything was organized at quite short notice and I had too little time to ask for clarifications directly to the artist. Dear Lorenzo, in your Caminantes project, yarns and fabrics are your favorite. So, uh, the Natalia, so, well, thank you. Yarns and fabrics are your favorite materials, along with cotiso, those colored irregular blocks of glass made in Murano, the island of Venetian glassmakers, whose technology was imported into Peru by your father in the 1960s. This way, you built original works that feature many Peruvian woolen threads and fabrics, plain or striped, such as the red floor and background of which these pieces stand out, this piece stand out, as well as a green fabric striped with yellow, red and burgundy folded and laid on a wooden log. The Venice of your father is represented by a block of yellow cortiso whose cold shape, supposed white and shine, contrasts strongly with the softness, suppleness, <coughs> and matte, matte appearance of the Peruvian island fabric. The next picture, colors and stripes are programmed from the design of the fabric since the weavers, here Tia Panchita from San Ignacio de Loyola in the Sierra de Trujillo on the north coast of Peru. Must have she must have prepared all the necessary balls of wool to warp between the pole, the, the visible pile and another at a good distance. This distance is equivalent to the length of the warp, a little more than the finished fabric. And the number of warp threads will give the fabric its width and stripes. It is very simple, as long as everything is programmed correctly. The warp is not cut at the top and at the bottom. Its threads are attached to the two bars of the loom in such a way that once woven, the fabric is born perfectly finished with two transverse selvages at the top and bottom and two longitudinal selvages on each side of the warp. The next, the next picture, yeah. like this miniature, no, no, the one before, <laughs> okay. Like this miniature by Shella Hicks, the resulting fabric has four selvages that do not need to be cut as it is considered a living being whose integrity must be preserved. This should be the case of the manta, so the next picture. Not, okay spread out here on the stony ground of the Paracas desert. The, legends, the legend tells of the presence of a cloth by Mariano Fortuny, 
a prominent Spanish textile designer of the first half of the 20th century who lived in Venice and reproduced many historic textiles with uh, artisan techniques. And Lorenzo, you own some of his pieces. I confess that from where we stand, the photo does not allow us to distinguish Peruvian from uh, Venetian fabrics, neither along the necessarily different quality nor by the cut of the European fabric entailed by the treadle loom used. The Paracas desert on the coast south of Lima is famous for the impressive quantity of funerary, funerary bundles. So the next picture. Buried in its austere sands. These funerary bundles or fardos consisted of many layers, as you see on the, on the left, on the bottom, buried in its austere sands. Uh, the, well, they, they consisted of many layers of textiles offered to each deceased buried in the site of Paracas necropolis between the 2nd century BC and the 2nd century AD, approximately. Each textile is constructed uh, of panels with four selvages, here with a feline repeated by following a checkered pattern in the center and the procession in the borders. And the next picture. And these are two other embroidery style from the same site, representing on the left snakes intertwined in the manner of Asia, and on the right a shaman displaying his bare torso, recognizable by his navel and his protruding ribs. The next picture. From the same desert, you step into a lighter area of soil and contrast the inhospitable landscape by drawing a colorful silhouette, even more mysterious than the previous shaman. It is made up of mantas, brightly colored woolen fabrics, plain and striped from the Andean Highlands. These are combined with a silk adorned with vegetal, vegetal decoration from the Fertini collection in Venice. Each textile entity is quite distinct from the others and various materials, foam, mask, vase and plastic complete the ensemble. Venetian silk is easily identifiable by its two-tone realistic decoration, far removed from the often stylized, stylized stripes and patterns that animate the fabrics of the Andes, whether very old fabrics, such as, such as those of Paracas, Necropolis, and the next picture, or more recent ones, such as this belt woven today in San Ignacio de Loyola, the village of Tia Panchita, on a loom that is much more complex than one might think by a quick look at it. Doña Filomena is selecting the threads of a warp against right to weave a diamond pattern that you see on the right, divided into four quarters. Thanks to a document from 1590, the next uh, picture, slide, which coded the design of a similar belt using numbers and letters, numbers for the number of yarns to pick and letters for their colors. We know that such belt was worn by the Koyas wives of the Inca emperors during the corn festivals and that they were called Saha, the name of corn in Quechua. As it is the case, 
to the Saint Ignacio. We even call the spelt Sarah. This type of loom and the mathematical skills implicated were therefore known to the Incas before the arrival of the Spaniards. Local weaving had nothing to envy to that of the Italian silks of the same period. Despite the complex loom, well, the next picture. Next slide. Yeah. Despite the complex loom painted in Florence by Apollonio di Giovanni and present in Venice to weave gorgeous velvets, the next slide. Uh, with two eighths of pile skillfully imitated by Fortuny. So the next slide again. But let us return to the silhouette in the middle of the desert and to other equally baroque versions of it, such as this one, dominated by the striped manta, or this one, the next, involving logs of wood and skeins of cochinilla dyed wool and at his foot various objects laid down as offerings. Do they correspond to the funerary bundles found in this desert? Are they inspired by the wakas? So the next picture, the next slide. Places of worship for local entities, deities sometimes made of a stone dressed up here with a small poncho and bags for coca leaves, accompanied by commander sticks and offerings. Or oh, are they inspired? So the next slide. By uh, the Apachita, those piles of stones often in unstable equilibrium that can be spotted on the edge of path or as here very close to the ritual enclosure of the island of Takile in the Lake Titicaca Lake. According to chronicles, these stone piles already existed in the Andes during the 16th century and may have been dedicated to the wind, according to Bartolome de las Casas, or to the god Pachacamac, or to the sun, or even to the gods of the past, which would be perfect for a traveler, caminante, like you, Lorenzo. <laughs> Hence arises a question prompted by re-examining the photo on the left, did you go to Takile Island in the summer of 2012? So the next dia. In any case, you were in 2019 on the heights of the Altiplano in a very bleak landscape, even frightening when the storm strikes the spot. It may have been the moment when you set up your version of a ritual mesa, the next slide, to appease, appease the lightning and the thunder. But did your offerings of small pieces of cariso in an environment made of stones and terracotta and not textiles and coca leaves, as in Cusco in 2012, succeed in appeasing the elements? Or was this interpretation made in Venice and determined by the limited means available to you there? So the next. In the Laguna, the register you adopt changes as everything becomes stable, almost ordered by the local devices for drying nets and perhaps for mooring boats. The next. 
The Andean mantas on Fortuny's fabrics are turned into surfaces unfolding in space. Wood, what, so the next, wood and woolen threads float, that being another form of travel. A similar order resonates in the studio, so the next, with the same skeins of woolen threads waiting with nonchalance to be used. Finally, having noticed the far fewer Venetian than Andean textiles in the photo files I surveyed, I would like to draw your attention to a source that could broaden your experience and vocabulary. These are the few Italian and French workshops where you will access lively knowledge, just like you can find it in the Andes. I know because you told me that meeting artisans is important for you. For instance, you can access the silk velvet hand weaving in the Bevilacqua workshops in Venice, where looms that are akin to the one painted in the 15th century by Apollonio di Giovanni are still operating. The remnants of dyed skeins, silk skeins, echo the colored wool yarns on sale in the shops of Andean villages. While on the rack, the, the next uh, picture, the next slide, white, yellow, and crimson silk warps are also waiting to be used. My second suggestion concerns another family of textiles produced in Italy since the end of the 12th century and in pre Hispanic Peru for a long period of time light fabrics made of cotton or silk and valued for their ability to play with the wind and or for their transparency. In Europe, silk sandal was appreciated in the Middle Ages for banners and standards and veli, as its name suggests, for veiling or unveiling faces and places. Fortuny, the next. Uh, no, uh, there is one missing. Well, well Fortuny, ah, yeah, no, the, yeah, thank you. Fortuny was very much interested in it as this photo of Geraldine Chaplin in an ethereal show, uh, shows. And these fabrics are still in use today, as you see on the right uh, part of the slide. In Peru, such pieces are common. Yes, in Peru, well, so the next. In Peru, such pieces are common in pre-Hispanic burials along the coast and are still produced by district of Huanuco weavers who spin extra fine threads and weave transparent plain weave whose origin seems to date back to the Incas, at least, such as the Sarah Belt. For the frequent, frequent absence of decorations, these fabrics have been invisible, made, they have been made invisible so far, but it is time to delve into the knowledge that makes the production of these exceptional pieces possible. This is a new form of collaboration between Christina Jara, the local weaver, and Limenian anthropologist Maria Elena del Solar, which accounts for their publication today. In conclusion, the works of Lorenzo Vitui reveal a fragile balance and a certain anxiety in the Andean context a greater stability and even relaxation in the Laguna. It is true that the natural elements can rage frequently in the Andes, which has driven the populations to organize a whole series of expressions and rituals, 
to protect themselves as best as they can. Since he has an interest in them and their conscience, Lorenzo Vitulli reveals them in some of the pieces and in the title of the exhibition. Can the accumulation and proximity as well as the continuity of certain textile productions over several centuries in Bath, Peru and Venice create an effective metissage that would stabilize the situation? This is a question. I will end with this last uh, diapo and with a question in connection uh, with this, can this be a self-portrait of Lorenzo Vitulli as an artist studying two worlds? I have made many guesses, now I am looking forward to Lorenzo's uh, view. So I have finished. <laughs> it is full of questions and guesses. Thank you, Sophie. Uh, thank you for the beautiful letter, actually. But I cannot see the images anymore, unfortunately. Can you, because I don't see the last picture you show me about the potential for a self-portrait, Sophie. Ah, so no, the next one, the next dia. I know, I know, I know, but let me check here because there was something here with the system that I cannot say. I can see only the your face, but not your images. Natalia, it is a, the last one. So last. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but I uh, think I'm. Let me try. Yeah, I see it. But I've seen all the. I mean, I I was here listening all to them. I listened to all the letter, and I found it really interesting. I'm I'm ready to answer to your questions actually they were beautiful questions and um but i wanted just to i, I just missed the last picture with the self uh, portrait uh -huh. and i'm trying to get it uh, let's see, let me see because it is a true yes mm -hmm. <laughs> i would like to understand if no, i mean standing because i uh no I, I love your presentation because it was, I mean, uh, of course, you know, uh, thanks to your knowledge of the, the material and the Peruvian text, I, that's why I was really, when we first talked, it uh, was um, really useful to me to have your, you know, your point of view uh, of my work and also to have like a deeper view about the, the material, in, like in a more uh, historical uh, frame and also anthropological. But um, remembering all the, um, your questions, I mean, I, Especially that one regarding the um, the shapes of the sculptures uh, that you, you know you found this connection with the, the funeral uh, humbles, uh, which is something that actually um, it was part of my uh, in a way of um, sources because you know usually when I especially in Caminantes the idea of each sculpture is like a sort of a the idea of a fragment of a root. And, uh, but also I really try to mix different, um, different sources and different ideas. First was, you know, exactly like a sort of an offering to a landscape. And, um, and, I, and I'm really happy that you chose and that, uh, that image in the Paracas desert where, the, where there's the wood trunks and, um, and the alpaca yarn. Because actually for the first time, I usually, you know, I build the sculpture and I leave, you know, I leave all the materials there. So it's a, it's a really, is a kind of, because I'm traveling, so, you know, I, it's also is a problem of time, but also it's, you know, it's part of the, of the project to invent and create this, my own personal rituals. And, uh, and in this case, my ritual was just to, you know, to offer and to live as this was done, you know, in the past by the Incas and by different other civilizations. But it's really like the idea of as an assigned to, to leave something to the landscape and maybe also to someone who will come later and to, or maybe just to nature to transform it. So it's, uh, uh, you've seen only that picture, but usually uh, I have like three or four pictures of the same corner because I came back in that same spot, like in a, in a period of uh, three weeks. And it's interesting how, you know, the sculpture actually transforms uh, himself, you know, uh, along the time. 
and I like the idea of you know really offering something and leaving to you know even to another traveler, and, and that's one of the ideas. Another idea is about I wanted really to um, recreate, and this is like more uh, talking about the, the the formal, the aesthetic of the sculpture is to recreate. I don't know if you have uh, in mind, but the, the bricola in Venice, which is, you know, is the, this kind of wood pole that are used to, uh, for, you know, especially by Venetians with a boat to actually to stop and to, to sign the road in Venice. They're usually transformed and uh, reinvented by the locals, adding different kind of materials. Sometimes, you know, when fishermen, they add like nets, so they add like all the little tools that they need to, to travel and to to feed to to live in the lagoon, uh, and so I you know I, I've been always really intrigued by the this kind of uh, you know random creativity applied by the by the locals, and I tried to you know to actually bring it back in my own sculptures. So it's uh, my sculpture that is always a mix of different. You know, in this case, you know, like historical ideas like the the funereal humbles. And I think that um, what I was more interested in is this idea of that the, the, the Inca really won't like to wrap everything. It's also that the, the human body was wrapping different layers of uh, uh, fabrics. And it's something also I recreated in the, in the sculptures that you see some elements are, you know, I uh, repeat this action of wrapping everything, of wrapping all the materials that I travel with and I wrapping all the, uh, the materials that I collected along the trip. So. It, at the end of this, you know, the idea of the, of the sculpture is, is a mix of different uh, sources, different ideas. And uh, yeah, and, and also I think I've never been to the island you show me in the Titicaca, but I've been to the Kiki, Titicaca region in Peru and this, I was really actually, uh, I, I saw those shapes that were used because also the, all, also the people and the people who travel along Peru, I think that they, they repeat, you know, this kind of really easy, uh, by the end, I think quite beautiful, you know, like a really uh, um, easy, like sculpture, like female sculpture just adding one stone on top of the other. And this is something that again is a, is a sculpture that signs the road and is, um, it was, uh, I think also was part of that of the idea. I think is, you know, sometimes, you know, ideas comes while I'm doing my sculpture and then I don't recognize them, but I'm just, so it was really useful to to see in to sit in your in your slide. And um, apart, you know, other you know the other question because I wanted to uh, answer, but you made me a lot of questions, so I need to be. Uh, That's too many. <laughs> which was another the, the, um, about the um, the use of fabric, right? Mm -hmm. uh, in the first picture. I remember you uh, wanted to know exactly why I I used the uh, stripe fabrics. Do you remember well, or there was like a different uh, uh, question? Yeah. Where were these cotisso, the green uh, fabric and the wood board? Yes, yes. Well, I was very interested to to the feeling, the different feeling of the Venetian uh, cotisso and the smooth and uh, uh, Peruvian uh, fabric because uh, the contact and the feeling is in a certain way, well, correspond to, to male and female or to what is attributed uh, very uh, uh, without uh, analysis, but straight away by that. So I was very impressed by this first image. Uh, uh, because I think was, uh, what I really um, try to do, and also when I um, also in, it is like more is a still life, you know, it's like a really is an ephemeral sculpture, which is uh, here I'm just 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 different materials. But I were um, what I really like um, try to do was you know really playing with these completely different materials coming from completely two different parts of the world, two different cultures, and see how these two different materials interact. And uh, this is something that also I've done in my previous project because I really try to, um, in a way, create new um, meanings just in the uh, connecting these different materials that like in real life, they would never ex exist together. And of course, in this case, this, I mean, the connection is also um, based on my family history, but you know, I wanted just to investigate this kind of cultural mixing, but through the 
these different materials they completely you know from the cotiso to the fabric they, in a way there is no uh, a connection as you said there is more like a contrast you know of texture of material but at the end i think was uh, exactly but i was looking for this contrast and this instability that at the end i think is uh, you know just thinking of more like a symbolic uh, with a symbolic approach is exactly when you know two different cultures mix there are you know uh, contrast and uh, it's something that is is, a, is never stable it, there's always a state of instability and uh, in this kind of hybrid bodies and that's what i try to do also in the in the still lives by the end there is also a connection there is also you know it's, there is not only contrast i think there is also a sometimes an harmony and, uh, and in this case i think there was an harmony in the colors i mean i found there a lot of connections between the the colors used in the Murano glass production, which is, you know, is the main uh, element of the, and also why is uh, Murano glass is so, uh, has been so successful is exactly for the color, for the use of these really saturated colors that of course I found also, as you really uh, uh, well know in the, in the Peruvian uh, textile tradition, which was the use of these really uh, strong colors. So I found, you know, at the end of the, I think that this was this kind of, uh, connection in the chromatic level. Yes, well, thank you for your answer. <laughs> and I'm sorry, <laughs> but you cannot see the last one. No, I don't, do not, I cannot see the, I, I missed my, which, which, which image? Uh, because, you know, I cannot see the zoo. There is a, one window that completely disappeared. I don't know why, and I'm trying Lorenzo. to. Lorenzo. Yeah? Yes, Rafael speaking, I, I sent it to you. Ah, you sent it to me by email? Um, what's up? No. Oh, what's up? It is one with a yellow cotiso, and it is the image is on the ground uh, divided between blue and uh, Pugna, Pugna. And uh, there is uh, ah, yeah, 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 not the last thing. And when I no, look at it so well, is it somebody? Is it somebody's portrait? <laughs> <laughs> no, but this is a there is another thing also I really love about the, the, the Inca uh, tradition, which is this, you know, this kind of uh, interest and in, uh, uh, they have the Inca in transforming uh, natural uh, materials and also like using like big scale. I mean, talking mountains and desert and trying to recreate the, the human body, just using this kind of uh, altering the, um, the nature and the landscape. And I think there was something that also I, I was trying to experiment in, in a, like in a smaller scale in the studio, which is something, and it's not like a clear uh, figure. There is no face, but there is also, I mean, you can find it different faces. And I, I always like to give an image which is not like, a, has a, is recognizable uh, immediately. I really like to, you know, to leave also space to the viewer to invent their own shapes and find their own, faces and figures and uh, and with these organic materials i think is you know it's that's what i found what happened in this image but it was really interesting when you told me that um you found there was a lot of anxiety and stability more in the peruvian uh, you know interventions than compared to the more uh, peaceful and you know stable uh, interventions in the lagoon which is uh, interesting i'm going to <laughs> To focus on that because yeah. it's, it's true. It's a, it's a really interesting, um, uh, yeah, how you say, um, vision you had, and I think it's true. Of course, you know, Peru is more, um, of course, for me, is is a place where I, I spend less time compared to Italy. So for me, the lagoon is a more is a comfort zone, and of course, you know, Peru and uh, and all the stories behind my family in Peru are the more is you know things I still need to to discover, and that's I think that's why you you found that kind of more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, water, instability. And water is always more quiet than the mountains, and mm. specifically the mountains in the Andes. Yeah, of course, you know, as you know, uh, it's incredible how nature, there, the, the dimension of nature is still so, I mean, it's the main power there, there's no, and something with, I think we forgot a little bit, in, especially in Europe, in our cities, but in, as soon as you travel along the, um, you know, the Andes is exactly you. You remember was then the main uh, the main power, and this kind of instability is a daily struggle with you know uh, with the, that man still has to face with nature. It's incredible. I think, of course, I was traveling from the uh, Andes to the Amazon, and and it's um, 
Yeah, I think that's another, you know, reason of this kind of instability, which is also is an energy. It's not it's, it's something. It's, it's a vibrant energy that you know is you, you live while you travel along these kind of environments. And um, but yeah, we wanted to reply to another question. It's um, that you show me the picture of the the kiln, which is actually and you you were asking me if it was done yeah. in Venice or in. Uh, mm. Yes. In Cusco, actually, that is um, is a local um, ceramic uh, um, studio that I found in um, in the um, in the Selva. So we are north of Peru. Uh, it's uh, close to the Gokta, uh, the Gokta River Falls. It's a it's a beautiful place where there is this kind of uh, it's a community who work with ceramic and uh, and I I, um, I stay there for like one month and I work with the uh, with the kiln and uh, and that kind of things that you did they were like offerings and that's why I took the picture was actually the, the cotiso mix with the soil that I collected in the in that region and then I I, I, I was fused with the my was uh, it could also really look like an offering as well yeah oh well so when you did it you never you didn't think about an um, offering a mesa you were not thinking about that, <laughs> so I, I, was, <laughs> I was placing, but you know, I was I I I, I was placing all the different uh, pots with the cotiso inside because I, I mixed the cotiso with the pots. So then at the end, you know, it's, uh, if you see, there is also one picture in the exhibition. Is the um, still live with the green uh, background? You see that the cotiso, which is totally melted inside these uh, ceramic pots, that's something that I wanted. This is, was another idea of the process was not just to you know uh, as you usually do in a photograph to um, just you know uh, juxtapose the materials one to next to each other but also to have like a chemical fusion of the different materials and uh, I think the result was really interesting. Yeah oh, well I have a few questions for instance the first the one the first one would be why didn't you use the sea the Peruvian sea but uh, Venetian Laguna, Lagoon, you, you ha the, the sea is present in your Venice uh, pictures, but not mm -hmm. in the Peruvian one. While when the sea is very important in Peru too, you have a Selva, no, 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 no. Your photos from the Selva, I have not shown, and from the mountains and from the desert. Yeah. And, but but not nothing there. about the sea. You're right, but at first, even no, the lagoon is, is more <laughs> tranquil than the, the Pacific Ocean. If I would have tried to merge myself in the Pacific Ocean, okay. which I would have, I don't think I would have been here uh, talking with you because you know the power of the ocean is. Uh, but you're right, it's something is because I started, I think, with my, my priorities was to start with the the, the, the the environment that really you know I worked the most was the Paracas region and all the desert because we're actually where my father went and started, that was a similar um, environment when my father started the, the glass production because, you know, in the 60s, the Lima outskirts were actually, you know, was like this kind of really desertic uh, land. And also because I'm really um, interested and I'm really uh, just like personally intrigued by the, by the desert the environment was perfect also as a, as a landscape to you know, to interact also with the, with the sculptures because there was exactly, it was a perfect um, landscape. And um, I think, you know, the, the ocean is, uh, I would also, is something which you're right is missing because it's a really important, uh, uh, it's a really important environment for, for Peru for sure. But it's more difficult to, to control, I have to find a, to find a way to to do it because also in the in the lagoon of course it was um, easier to work but also i found this kind of connection between the lagoon landscape and the uh, desert of paracas because they are really similar in the way there are two different one is a desert of water and the other one is a is a sand desert and it was uh, and because i'm i'm trying to find the uh, as i said like also this kind of uh, connections between these two different distant landscapes and um, that's why I really focus my, my attention on these two different environments. 
Yeah, well, I have lots of other questions, but uh, probably it is not the place to ask more questions because we should. Uh, there's, if I may, there's a question in the, um, in the chat from Veronica. Uh, who says, Lorenzo, that she was able to see your wonderful work in Amsterdam and uh, was fascinated by the richness in colors and textile. And I would like to know why are textiles, patterns and colors important in your work? And are Caminantes, so the title of the work, uh, persons you did have the opportunity to talk with? No, sorry, the last, I missed the last part. Are the Caminantes, the title of the, of the work, are they persons you did have the opportunity to talk with? Hmm. From what the title refers to, I mean, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'm starting actually from the last um, question, actually. Yeah, it's the Caminantes, actually, is, uh, which means walkers in, uh, in Spanish. And it comes actually from a Spanish uh, poem. And uh, it comes also from, uh, uh, is, another like kind of connection that I found in my story here in Venice because this phrase uh, caminantes no hay camino hay que caminar was a title used by um, Luigi Nono which is a Venetian uh, composer uh, that um, died in the 70s and he actually had this um, connection with Peru because he uh, he went to Peru and, and he went to, he was traveling in the Andes and he, while he entered in, a, in an old church and the culture of this church, he found this phrase written on the wall, Caminantes no hay camino que caminar. And he came back to Venice and he um, actually, one of his last, actually his last um, composition is actually, uh, he, he chosen this title. And he, um, how do you say, he devoted the, the, the composition to the Peruvian uh, campesinos. Uh, of course, there was the 1960s, so it was a really, um, you know, it was an active political uh, um, situation in Peru. And so this, can, this was another connection that I found between Peru and Venice, and that's why I started from Caminantes. And the Caminantes then became these, uh, like, um, walkers, so people actually, had a, you know, a similar story of uh, maybe with their family that they've, you know, in a way been forced, so they had to move from one place to another and they, in this kind of movement, and they activated a, um, a process of cultural mixing. So that's why I, I call them Caminantes. And I started to collect a series of interviews. So I inter you know, interviews with all the people I, I collaborated with. So they were like from the, um, Weaver in the Andes, who you know was uh, that I she made all my like a lot of the mantas that I used, and also she provided me with of all the um, the yarns, and I um, and of course you know when I activate this collaboration, I like to also to do interviews, and these interviews are going to, they're going to be part of the second phase of the of the work, and and of course also in Venice I have uh, similar stories. For example, this is the story of the Japanese. Uh, um, Glass blower who arrived in, uh, in from Japan to Venice in his twenties and uh, without speaking a single word of um, of Italian and, uh, and of course and started this kind of really long process of entering the closed environment of the Murano glass uh, blowers and, and now he he's you know he finally managed managed he's a master of glass. And I started a collaboration even with him. And it's, uh, so these are the, the Caminantes. So like people who share this uh, similar story of mine. Mm -hmm. And uh, the other question was the texture, right? Um, yeah. Why? Uh, a broader question is about uh, why are textiles, patterns and colors important in your work? You know, textures is, um, you know, of course, color is a really is one of the main uh, elements of my work, and it's uh, and of course, you know, because in my previous um, project, I've been, you know, uh, the work I've done in um, Dalston in London, which was you know, again like a story about a local market, and then of course in Nigeria and Lagos again another local market, and of course the color is was. Uh, one of the main elements that I found it was, uh, and it's you know, it's, it's a really um, 
strong sign of the vital energy that I found in both environments and realities. And that's why I, of course, I, I, did, I did not have any other choice than use them. And uh, so, it's, uh, as I said, and I usually, all my ideas come from the streets. So if I, and, um, and that's why, and also the textures were really important in, in, in both subjects, you know, this kind of really organic textures of all the products coming from, uh, from Africa, from uh, especially Nigeria and Ghana. And, um, and of course, in working with materials, the textures become really in another really as the color, a really important uh, side and tool to, to, to recreate this kind of energy that I found in, uh, in these two different micro realities. Mm -hmm. And uh, just finishing, of course, you know, also my, from my side, my vision also really, you know, coming from uh, Venice, I've been always really uh, interested in painting and, uh, you know, the Venetian school, it has been from the beginning, you know, it's been actually compared to the Florence school, also the, the school from Rome were more attached to drawing and to, you know, not to, to color while the, instead the, the Venetians, like with Giorgione and Veronese, I mean, the, mm -hmm. the revolution was exactly to, not to start a painting with a drawing, but with a color. And I always, from the beginning, when I you know, was studying painting at the, in Venice, I, I really found, you know, the, quite close to this approach of uh, representing reality through the color. Mm -hmm. uh, if I can add something, uh, something uh, I would say that uh, textiles, is a prime uh, media, artistic media in the Andes, uh, far ahead. Uh, I know exactly, of course. Yeah. So no, no, but... we, we, it is difficult for us from a European perspective to feel that because textile here is always a decorative art, but uh, there it is uh, the main art. And from very early, from the second millennia BC, at least. Mm. And yeah, exactly. That's why for Caminantes, I mean, this, I was talking about, about those anatomy and uh, Balogun, which are both in the exhibition, uh, referring to Caminantes. I mean, the idea of, like, just Sophie said, you know, the idea of using the Peruvian textile is exactly for this reason, because as, uh, you know, the, the Incas, they even, didn't use um, any drawing or didn't uh, use uh, language, but everything was, I mean, the main tool of expression was exactly textile and was, of course, one of the most important uh, elements and material of the society was, uh, was I think, even, um, so, uh, Sophie, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but it was even more, um, how do you say, uh, the value of text, of certain textiles in the Inca, um, period was more valuable than gold or like really or metal it was really it was a sign of uh, so that's why it was impossible to talk about like Peruvian culture without using the uh, textile as a, as a as a material yeah and textiles were sacrificed to the dieties they were burned or they were alerted to for the dieties so and Sophie does it was Today, to yeah. today in, in Peru, does the textile still have this, uh, let's say, high position in uh, arts? Does it still consider the same? Well, what do you call arts in Peru? If you visit people in the mountains, then textile is still the, the main the the media expression or imitation or an aesthetical expression. Mm -hmm. But of course, if you are in Lima, it, well, Lima is like Europe. Mm. Mm -hmm. More or less, it depends with which people you are. Mm. That's true. It's true also because I noticed that, and I had a lot of problems in collecting the um, the mantas. You know that the, all these mantas that I found that they were especially from the. I mean, they told me they were like from the seventies, eighties because it was. Uh, I mean, what they. Um, I'm talking about not the uh, communities in the Andes which are still producing a lot of textile, but they told me that a lot of you know young people now they decided to stop the production of of, of uh, handmade uh, textiles for like a more mechanical uh, reproduction. I don't know if you find this was fine because it was quite difficult in that part of you know Cusco, uh, but of course the Valle Sagrado, which is the most touristic part. But this kind of uh, they they are starting also there to stop the production of these mantas that before were used in every house not only as a um, decoration as you said but mainly as a really 
as a um, you know as a carpet or as a for different was you know it's a really common and important part of the house but they i noticed that they, they also especially in the valle sagrado they they also stopping the young people to you know to lose the, this um, the learning techniques of uh, to make textile well it, it is long and difficult and, uh, and, it, and you really need to think to uh, to use your brain it is not just take a three threads and build something it is much more complicated and also the fact that uh, the fabrics have four selvages it means that uh, it is um, longer to weave because at the end when you have a few centimeters it's very long to enter the wefts inside the warps and uh, so now for instance in Aquile for uh, tourists they uh, weave very long fabric they cut and they make a scene and they know that the tourists will not uh, notice that but for themselves they would never use these fabrics with uh, on these uh, the long selvages and not the transverse selvages. If the fabric has not uh, four selvages in a certain way, it is not a lively fabric. It doesn't exist or it, it, is, uh, it is wrong. And you never cut the fabrics. Exactly. Yeah. And this makes that the, it is impossible to weave them on a treble loom, on a modern loom. And this is why the Andean loom is still used in the mountains because you cannot weave a fabric with four selvages outside of this loom. So it is something that makes the production slow and uh, 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 constant and uh, chronologically um, uh, transmitted from one generation to the other and something, but at the same time, it's something very stable and very uh, it uh, gives uh, stability to 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 the uh, wall uh, uh, construction of fabrics. Mm -hmm. so it's, um, it's very it's quite special. Lorenzo, did you know um, the workshop that Sophie has uh, pointed out in uh, in Venice, uh, the Belli Belli <laughs> uh... Yeah, but it's a really famous uh, workshop. It's true. I mean, they're still using uh, the same wood machines that they use in the 16th century. I think uh -huh. it is incredible. It's, of course, it's a really. I visited once, and it's, uh, it's yeah. It's, I mean, nothing has changed in the last 16th century. They're still uh, exactly following the um, production of this. Um, this kind of really, it's called the broccato. I mean, it's a really, uh, yeah, um, farming one with a lot of values. It's beauty, it's incredible. And especially it's incredible, the workshop, because it's really, they're using a technology that, you know, hasn't changed in the last, cent, you know, five centuries. Mm -hmm. well, there, there is a mechanic above the, instead of a draw, a draw, a draw boy, there is a mechanic above the loom, but it is the only change in it. And uh, well, I, I, I presented it, I thought that you knew it, but because we are used to look at artisans abroad in the Andes, mm -hmm. and we don't look at artisans here, just at a few hundred meters from where we live. And so my uh, putting it in the, in the PowerPoint was to say how, uh, we look, we can also look at textiles here in Europe the same way as we look at it in uh, uh, abroad because um, uh, we've hand weaving, well, hand weaver have a knowledge which is very important and, uh, and the same quality, different, very different, but the same quality as the weavers in the Andes. So uh, it is as if in the Andes, it was more interesting than in Europe in a certain way because it looks more um, uh, more traditional or more uh, 
Uh, but, but it is the same uh, situation, well, at least for me. <laughs> no, of course, my no is uh, of course in my work. It's one of my uh, part of my process exactly to activate these uh, collaborations with uh, local artists, and it's something that is really yeah. part of my process. In Venice, of course, Venice has been for uh, you know for uh, this is is well known for this tradition of craftsmen, and unfortunately, they are disappearing. So there is you know, Baby Laco is one of the few who is resisting because it has become a big name, and is of course is uh, is uh, it became also really is is more like is a luxurious. Uh, product now, uh, the Bevi L'Aqua textile. So um, it would be also difficult to activate a collaboration uh, with them. I wanted to, and it's interesting how now they're using this kind of, there's also this um, group of young teenagers who work inside Bevi L'Aqua and they're actually continuing the, the tradition. So I think it will, uh, it will survive. And um, but you know, of course with them, um, I use the Fortuny um, textiles because I was really interesting in the history of uh, Mariano Fortuny in this kind of, uh, which is a sort of a uh, man ray. I mean, I've been intrigued by this um, person who is really mixing different disciplines in his practice from like a set designer to a fashion designer, painter, and uh, and um, also textile designer. So I was really, and he started his production in uh, in Venice coming from Spain. And um, and he invented this new technique of printing on on uh, on textiles. So it was uh, that's why I, w I wanted to have um, uh, I wanted to have one of you know I, to work with the with the um, Fortuny textile. And also that's why I started to research and I found this old stock from the fifties and sixties of all the Fortuny's. Uh, um, Textiles that I could use without spending a fortune, also as a as a material to to work and uh, and to travel with. Uh, of course, it is really similar to to Baby mm -hmm. The only difference, we unfortunately, that the fourteen production has changed completely and has been uh, acquired by a. Uh, I think it's um, I think no, I don't know if it's an American brand, but of course they, in, you know, the, the the process is not, you know, the, the quality of the process is not as uh, as good as it used to be. But it's, uh, they are still producing also here in, in Venice. Yeah. Okay, there was one last question. It was about the Fortuny fabric that you used, so you actually just answered. Um, Okay, so um, I think we'll, um, uh, if you uh, find Sophie and Lorenzo, we will uh, um, leave the word to Natalia. It was a very interesting talk. Um, Sophie, Thank you, Sophie. I was uh, really, um, I expected a lot um, your, your light on the Lorenzo's work and the, the textile um, a bond that you could uh, you could uh, uh, explain. So that was a really um, super interesting talk. Thanks a lot for your research and uh, and the parallel that you made. And thank you, Lorenzo. So now we'll uh, be welcoming uh, Natalia. Um, yeah, just a second. I put my camera. Okay. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, we can hear you. Okay, great. So, good evening, everyone. Uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, the Photographic Center, Ron, and especially Rafael for the invite uh, to be part of this event. Uh, can you see the screen? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, uh, I am uh, Natalia Bobadija. I also want to thank uh, Lorenzo and Sophie uh, for, for being here with me in this event, uh, The Big Picture. So I am Natalia Bobadija. I am a PhD in management science. So I'm completely in a different field than Sophie. I'm organization theory and work. And, and I work as an assistant professor at the University of Rouen, Normandy. And I am a member of the NIMIC laboratory. So my research mainly focuses on organizational mutations and, and their effects of, on individuals, teams, and urban areas. And I try to combine longitudinal and art-based uh, methods to explore the spatial, aesthetic, and temporal dimensions of change in organizations. Um, 
So today, in this conversation with uh, Lorenzo Vitturi, uh, my idea is to exchange and to question what markets uh, actually are physically, aesthetically, and conceptually. But especially, I will focus on two of Lorenzo's uh, projects. So Dalston Anatomy and Money Must Be Made. So these two projects differ in terms of the timing of the conception and publication, but they also differ in the field in in immersion by the artist. So uh, I also have the time to discuss briefly with uh, Lorenzo, who explained to me uh, some of his motivations, but I have taken the input from the discussion to prepare this presentation plus uh, my knowledge. So as I said, I'm interested in these two main projects, Dalson Anatomy and Money Must Be Made. They were uh, made at different points of time. And of course, they relate to two different places. So on one hand, we have the Ridley Road Market uh, in East London in the UK in 2013. And on the other hand, we have uh, the project Money Must Be Made, who was inspired by the Bal Balogun Market in Lagos, Nigeria. So uh, when I when I analyzed these two artistic projects, five concepts came to my mind. So market spaces, place appropriation, aesthetics and materiality, sorry, gentrification. And uh, from my point of view, I see a lot of tensions in this artistic work. Uh, but before moving forward, I would like to just uh, come back to, to recall some notions about markets. Uh, so markets, what are markets? So historically, markets have been defined by the movement of people and commodities from and between various places of production, distribution, and consumption. But they are also important nodes of passage of the, I mean, they, they, they will help the development of new modes of social ordering. So coming from the, from the bottom up. And marketplaces, are, it, marketplace is a particular type of commercial place in which, because we have a face-to-face -face trade, a feature of the daily marketplace, uh, there is information asymmetry since we don't know uh, the price. I mean, the buyer and the seller do not have the same information. There is a lack of formal market devices and bargaining exists as a model of price setting. And all of these uh, uh, features fit into the anthropo anthropological definition of, of bazaar level commerce. But what is interesting is that in organization studies and in the social studies, uh, most of the work has been focused on co consumer culture and the aesthetics of uh, more capitalistic commodities and commercial spaces such as shopping malls and global media culture. And a few works have, have looked at uh, popular commodity aesthetics or market spaces. So uh, these um, uh, more uh, marginal spaces have had less present in the, in the scientific work. So when we, in organization studies, when we talk about space, uh, when we talk about, when we call it for a theoretical approach, the work of Henri Lefebvre, and to a lesser extent, the work of uh, Doreen Massy, constitute the most uh, important references, but for bon, especially the work of Henri Lefebvre, uh, who explains that space uh, is a social production, and to understand uh, it's, social and political, politically, politically produced. And he uh, explains space through three main dimensions. So the conceived space, the perceived space, and the lived space. So uh, the trilogy of uh, Lefebvre must be understood as uh, the three dimensions should be understood in one. But uh, so the conceived space refers to uh, the space made by uh, architects and town planners. So it's a pure mathematical figures and messages. The perceived space refers to how uh, users of space move and practice space. And the lived space, it's uh, the space which is more metaphorical, is the space of subjectivity, human experience and imagination. So uh, the, the interesting thing about the trilogy of the Lefebvre is that these three conceptions of space in reality will create conflict and tensions and politics. So because the conceived space, for instance, if we look at the market, let's say a market is occupied in a certain place, uh, but it's, uh, this conceived space will, be, uh, will provoke 
resistance by groups who defend and seek to reconstruct elite space. For instance, when we close the market, market space, well, so the, the users and the, uh, the sellers will be uh, in um, fighting to recover this uh, lift space, okay? So, but the three dimensions of Lefebvre, Lefebvre are, are key to understand space and, and the tensions and conflict that could exist in the different perceptions of space. Uh, the another interesting um, theory about spaces and places is Dramacy, who completes and builds on Annie Lefebvre, but she, she, she brings a more, uh, let's say, um, vi a different vision of space in the sense that she focuses on, on the, the place of relationships to build space. And for her, it's the fortitudes and the random juxtaposition of trajectories that meet in time and in space that will build a place. So, but for her also, place is a moment of power and places are unique by the heterogeneity, which means also because spaces are built of different trajectories and are heterogeneous, they will also have tensions and build and be source of creativity. But at the same time, they, they can uh, have uh, issues. So in organizational studies, uh, we differentiate the type of spaces in order to what they produce. And when I looked at the work of Lorenzo, for me, two major themes in the sp spatial literature uh, came to my mind. So there is the notion of free space by Poleta, which is a more uh, political vision of space. And we call these spaces free spaces because they are beyond the direct control of dominant groups and individuals participate in these spaces on a voluntary basis. So we can, to give you an example about free spaces, we can think of uh, the 19th century re religious festivals in which people uh, had the arena to exchange ideas and information, or we can think about uh, public rituals or organizations such as the African American churches that fueled the civil rights movements and, and, and serve uh, as a tool to promote collective action. Uh, so uh, the importance of free spaces can be explained uh, in particular by looking at uh, the, the concept of Foucault, of, uh, in which for him, for Foucault, for instance, there is, a, um, there is, there is no separation between space and power. Well, what is particular about the concept of free spaces is that we can think about free spaces in a virtual way or, or in a physical way, in a symbolic manner. But I think, uh, I mean, uh, for me, mar for markets as shown in the artistic work of uh, uh, Lorenzo can be considered as free spaces be if they provide an emancipatory potential. That's uh, the condition, let's say. Another concept uh, that, that I, can, I can connect to Lor with Lorenzo's work is the, the idea of the third place, which was, so third places are places that are in between. So the idea of these places is that they're blur boundary. So uh, it was developed, the concept was developed by Oldenburg, but he, was, uh, he, he used this term to designate spaces that were not home or work. And, and for instance, in markets, we see people come to work, but there is a strong sense of belonging and community and friendship. And so, and because this in, inter, intersect, intersecting space, um, they use different norms. They are uh, potentially a, a source of both uncertainty of creativity. So when I look at Lorenzo's work, I, Thing that would depend on the place because he explores different market spaces, marketplaces. We could see that they could be free, considered as free spaces or as a third places. But I mean, what um, what I see is that there is a recursive unfolding of this spatial and the social. So as humans transform the places or the markets they occupy those places come to transport them. And this is where it comes uh, at the heart of, of Lorenzo's work, uh, what we see in Lorenzo's work. Uh, so it's the making of the place, the appropriation strategies. So as I said, 
the place is made of different, the space is made of different dimensions and it will build through tensions. And boundaries, for instance, in this picture, we see that uh, boundaries and movement are key. And actually the street market vendors will build upon special routines, a sense of place, and they will build political alliances and they will defend their, actually their place by using different strategies because there will be people who own their locale and some others don't, so they are walking around selling their, their products. And we see uh, micropolitics of our allocation for, of a space. We can see it at a bigger level when, like they said, the space planners of the government will give access or not to a certain space. And uh, um, micropolitics will also regulate the interactions between vendors and government and among them. And of course, here we are at the heart of the informal organization. So which are, we see the practices of networking, which are used that are outside the control of uh, like the official regime. So as part of uh, the, the, what I see in the Lorenzo's work, there is a lot of uh, materiality. The materiality, it's very present in his work and the use of, because objects in, at the market space help, and objects in general, helps help to shape identity and, and their um, uh, demar uh, of subjectivity. And I think of objects as a living, I mean, objects serves uh, as equipments for living because they're uh, the passage point for humans, uh, in the humans use in order to pursue their products. This is uh, the idea of uh, Bruno Latour and his work about uh, materiality, for instance. So here in this picture, I, 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 it really struck me in the morning bus we made and the, the other project, uh, Dalton Anatomy, seeing how the body is used as a shop. It's very aesthetic, but at the same time, you see but people need to create uh, appropriation and kind of uh, mechanism to be able to, right, to sell uh, their projects, their products. <laughs> I also, by, by looking at his, at the, at his work, uh, I, I, I see the, the appropriation of space make it possible to create different atmospheres and a, uh, a kind of a territory of freedom, uh, uh, some wild or sensual um, aesthetic, but uh, in terms of techniques, we see the use of appropriation methods as assemblings or, or ephemeral, uh, ready-made DIY practices are very present, which revealed if we connect DIY and organization, we, it, it, uh, it reveals a self-management approach. So uh, through these pictures, I also think about uh, ephemeral architecture or that we can juxtapose with the idea of learning to live in capitalistic ruins. So they are surviving in a messy architecture. I also think, and that we discussed with uh, Lorenzo on the creativity that is actually very uh, present in market marketplaces, because you see the way the products are displayed. Uh, it's very, it's very aesthetic, and actually vendors will use different techniques uh, to present their products or services. A, pro, a, a component of, of uh, these uh, street market aesthetics is the excess. So the excess of abandoned goods and abundance. So because nothing goes to wait, waste, part, sorry. And what I see also uh, in the work of Lorenzo, so it's a, uh, there is a form of putting uh, giving some life to ordinary objects. Objects. Well, also to come back to the idea of the third, third places, but actually in markets we're selling things, but traders' hands and mouths move in tandem. And in the matter of a minute, when you go to a market space like in Africa or in Delhi, uh, uh, conversations will start 
uh, about uh, traders' stories, about the products, where they come from. They will tell you uh, to what extent this product, this product is superior from others in the market and from its older versions. So actually, uh, what, is, what is, I see in his work is also this idea of storytelling, storytelling of objects. Um, to continue, uh, well, there is the issue of gentrification because uh, as, we see, as we see in these two pictures, so the one it's uh, on the left uh, relates to the Balogun market in Lagos and the other one it's in, it's in, in the UK, in London. But actually we see that uh, vending practices build praise reputations for markets. And Lorenzo's work highlights the nuance of street market aesthetics, but my question for him is, uh, what's the role of street markets in gentrification? Good. And to finalize, what I see uh, it's in, the, in Lorenzo's work it's, uh, and through market, it's uh, a lot of tensions because we could think that uh, markets are just simple systems. But when we look deeper, there are different layers of complexity. Uh, we could also ask the questions, are there really free spacers, autonomous geographies, or we can, or these markets are part of geopolitics at small case. Are these market space of resistance, or as we see, for instance, in the pictures of the, of the work in Lagos, that uh, this market is key because it's a key point of entrance of, for the Chinese product. So are we talking about space of resistance or are we, in attention also with the global domination from China, especially. And to finalize, uh, there is the tension between creativity and precarity. Because of course, these people are very creative and in the way to create businesses, to uh, show the products. Uh, and they, they, there, are, there are many sources of creativity, but there is also uh, precarity. So markets particular, particularly in these aesthetic dimensions, for me, uh, evidence of the struggles and ingenuity of ordinary lives at the margins of the global capitalism. So thank you. Uh, perhaps so uh, I would like, uh, Lorenzo, if you could uh, react uh, to my presentation and then we can um, discuss and participate with the audience. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no, thank you, Sophie. It was uh, incredible. I love to know it was a great presentation. You, you know, really managed to um, underline and discover. I mean, and to read all these uh, different layers that. Uh, uh, but I really found that you found uh, looking at my work. So it was really interesting your uh, approach from your point of view, which is, uh, um, yeah, exactly. It's interesting because I, I always try to. My work to create um, in each war, an artwork or image like different layers, you know, from like the more aesthetical to some, uh, you know, more uh, hidden uh, layers that are connected to, you know, more uh, issues like uh, anthropological or uh, in this case, uh, ethnographical issues. So it was, um, yeah, it was a fantastic uh, um, presentation. And uh, but where to start? I don't know, you, you know, because we've spoken already and, uh, you know, it's, I think well, we, well, we I have a question for you because it's, it's the end of my presentation. So what are the tensions you want to show in your work about markets? Is that an intention or what's the tension you want to show? What are the tensions? Well, it depends because there are two different works. In the first one, Dost Anatomy was, uh, of course, there was, that, that there was a tension and the tension was exactly the tension maybe faced uh, um, by the community in this case that was facing quite, you know, uh, this kind of uh, um, potential uh, displacement at the beginning, you know, like the community was, you know, uh, in a way forced uh, to move, you know, physically forced, but economically forced to move from a neighborhood that was, you know, their uh, original neighbor that completely was transformed uh, economically and socially in, uh, you know, more than 20 years. And of course they had to find, uh, you know, new strategies uh, to either to stay or just to, to move to another place. And this is one of the effects of gentrification that, you know, we 
we already spoke. So of course the tension you could feel is exactly how, you know, uh, in this case a neighborhood is, uh, is changing and the tension is, you know, is you can, that, you know, what I experience in talking with the people at the market when doing the interviews is exactly this, uh, the tension by the, uh, by the community that was, you know, in a way had to leave their, um, their neighborhood, their houses and find a new, uh, new location. Of course, that's why, you know, the idea of the sculptures was exactly this one too, you know, uh, representing an image in a visual, in a still life, in a female sculpture, this kind of uh, um, one side that, 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 of course, there was a beauty of which I, that to me, of course, was important because it was also a celebration of something which it was still existing on the street, this kind of vibrance, this kind of, uh, as I call uh, the beauty of an island of resistance where really people are trying to create alternative systems to the big distribution to survive and to organize their life, different, you know, cre uh, creative uh, strategies to organize this island of resistance. And on the other side, there was this kind of tension, you know, and this kind of uh, uh, precariousness uh, that, you know, you could, um, feeling in the neighborhood in the community so i think that the tension was you know in this kind of second element that i tried to to express and to communicate through the especially through the sculptural work okay uh and, and instead in the sorry because this was about uh, those and i mean uh, regarding uh, money must be made, I think that the tension uh, was uh, different because here there was a tension between two different realities. The reality of the, this case, you know, the, of the financial trust house and the story of this uh, uh, owner and the reality of this, um, you know, of the, of the, of this building in a way was representing this kind of uh, economic, um, boom of the 90s, you know, in uh, the tension between exactly this reality and the market reality, which was exactly in a, in a, in a phase of, of explosion of like uh, development. And, um, and of course here there was exactly, it was actually a, a real tension that I tried to, um, to visualize in the, especially in the, in the making of the book and, you know, how completely to confront these different, uh, completely different realities, but really close to each other. So exactly in the uh, here photography and the, the editing of the book was used exactly to, um, to make this tension visible in, uh, in a book and how completely these different uh, worlds that usually, you know, in, a, in, in the rest of the world, I mean, especially in Europe, you have uh, they are completely the opposite. That's why I called uh, sort of, you know, what I found in, in, in the street of Lagos in the Balogun market, a sort of gentrification in reverse because there was what is usually a, a victim of gentrification, like a local market. Here is actually, uh, um, here is actually the, the, the powerful part, but just because it's, you know, because of its, uh, because of different political reasons that are happening specifically in that part of Lagos, but also for the, this kind of uh, incredible scale of, uh, of the market, which is uh, growing and growing. Maybe Lorenzo, you can just um, tell a word for the people who don't know so well the, the series about, uh, because you just mentioned the Financial Trust House. Um, what's the dynamic between that building? What, what's particular of the history of that building? And how the market built itself against that that tower and the, the symbolics of these two spaces, no? Yeah, of course. No, sorry, because it's the but this story is quite incredible. It's something of which is I always like to to mention is is a really is a story that is you know is, is a really particular and peculiar story is happening in the center of uh, Victoria Island, Island, which is the one of the oldest part of Lagos, the capital of Nigeria, and um, in the center of this neighborhood, there is this financial trust house, which is in as a brutalist architecture that and, you know it was a sort of a symbol of the economic boom of the um, 90s in uh, in, La in Lagos, uh, Nigeria, and it was uh, you know it was a sort of uh, a base for all the it was 
hosting all the offices of um, mostly Western uh, corporations and banks, uh, you know, from, you know, so KLM to Bank of America to the, like, so really the, it's kind of quite, uh, you know, this well-known uh, Western uh, corporations. And uh, in the last 20 years, for different reasons, uh, mainly political, the local market that was actually, you know, limited to a little road uh, on the side of the building started to grow without any control and started to completely take over the space, actually physically the space around the building. Until when, uh, now in uh, 2020, the building has lost completely his uh, value, economical uh, value, and of course all the different uh, businesses moved to another area of the city. So that, that's the story and that's what I, what actually what I, what I found in, um, in this part of Lagos, while, you know, it's, as I said, it's a really specific case because then as soon as you move in the other neighborhood, you know, uh, the develop, development of the capital is really similar to the other, you know, uh, European or American uh, capital. So this is something is, uh, and it's, that's why I, I really focus on this quite, uh, I mean, it's a huge market because now it became, is the second biggest market of Africa. And uh, it sells mostly uh, product women who come from uh, the, like uh, mostly Chinese products. So it's, um, as also um, Natalia was saying, this is really is a, this is the story of a, is of a big market, but that really hides in his uh, system, in his uh, organization, all the, also the, this um, balances of the like a wider geopolitical uh, frame so that's why I, I decided to really to 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 to, divide, to make this work mm -hmm. uh, Lorenzo I, I think there are some colleagues from the laboratory and I think it would be um, it would be interesting that you could see if you could tell us more about while well, you talk about um, capturing the aesthetics of the market mm. uh, tell, tell us more about how you work I mean, but because for me, your, the artistic processes and scientific processes are quite similar. And how do you come from uh, like going to the field, as they call it, and producing uh, your artwork? What are the stages uh, that you go through? Yeah, I mean, usually I organize my processing like in, um, I could say, two, three phases. The first one is, you know, exactly as you said, I mean, I go into the field. I mean, I. In the case of the market, I really is a period of discovering uh, a new reality, a new space, and trying also to uh, create a connection with, uh, in this case, a local community. So I, you know, in this case of the market, it, in Dorsten, for example, it took some time because there was also a sort of a resistance towards photographers and video makers because, you know, uh, the same video maker and journalists use the market, especially when I started in 2013 as a subject, you know, of, uh, of journalistic scoops. So uh, it took me quite a while to get a sort of a, a trust from the people because I, and I need to have this trust because I also uh, photograph, you know, I did a lot of se long series of portraits. And, uh, and this is, you know, this is the first phase. So it's, it's quite, uh, and it's maybe the, um, it's a long phase because, you know, it takes some time. In those anatomy it was maybe, this is two years, and uh, at the same time, when I, you know, I start this kind of uh, phase of discovering the field, I also start um, second phase of uh, collecting materials, which is, you know, quite a main part of all the work. And I start to collect materials that I usually find really, actually, literally on the street, or they are given to me by the, you know, in this case, by the um, by the stall keepers, like the people working in the in the in the market. And then all these materials actually is moved inside my studio where I start to, uh, in a way to, to work with this material. I start to transform the material and I start to, or the, the more sculptural work in, in the studio environment. And here also this, you know, the, the, the visual uh, material that I produced in the field goes, you know, it starts also to, to get edited together with my sculptural work. And uh, here is where I, I start to kind of this kind of third phase where I start to to um, edit all this kind of material together and trying to to build a book or an exhibition. I mean that's the the structure of the of the work. But you know it's a, it's a kind of um, I work with fragments. You know it's to me that the, the research in the field is trying you know, trying to get as many fragments of this uh, space reality that I um, investigate and discover, and then you know everything is 
recomposed in a, of course, also following like a quite a poetic uh, vision. You know, here there is no, I'm not a photojournalist, I'm not a reporter. So everything is get through my personal lens and my, yeah, in a way it's a, it's a poetic vision, but still you know, it's really connected to, to the, to the daily life of the, in this case of the market. And what echoes also the, um, the, the market mechanics is the way you, you make circulate uh, the, let's say the, the objects or the products. And uh, for instance, for money must be made, uh, you did kind of Im import some, uh, some of these products to your London studio, right? Yeah, yeah. So there is always, um, of course, in Dawson it was easier logistically because everything was happening in front of the studio. So, you know, it was really a continuous work. But of course, the money must be made. You know, I was working in, uh, in Legos and I had to move a lot of, uh, of the material from Legos to, um, to my studio in London. But this is something that I really, you know, it's a, it's a way, because I'm really interested in the movement, you know, of people, of goods and all the different dynamics behind this process so it was I think then at the end it becomes part of uh, um, of the process as well because then all these materials that I, you know they've been transported to um, uh, to to my studio actually personally transported in this case because I really made physically like five bags of uh, 60 kilos of all kind of materials and actually I don't know how I managed to enter in uh, London but I uh, um, so in, in the studio, all these different materials then, you know, get uh, a new life and they're then mixed with the materials that are already in my studio. And this here is uh, when I really, all how these different uh, inner meanings that each object and material have, they start to, to come out and, uh, and, and especially they come out when I start to mix all these different materials and maybe, you know, all these um, meanings and things that maybe I, I didn't get in the, you know, in the sort of... Um, in the field because sometimes you know, the field is more like a chaotic and then the rhythm is, is faster but I mean you're in the stillness of the studio really managed to have a more uh, um, how do you say like a more uh, reflective approach to the to all the different materials that I that I replace but I think that's you know this is really a crucial part when I start to to play and to connect these different materials together and where the really is the more um, I mean is a really um, crucial part of all the process. And also another aspect is, uh, for instance, when you, uh, when you did the Darston Anatomy, so the first project that you, that you made in 2014-15, right? Um, you also uh, like did the movement back to the market and uh, can you can you speak about that the the kind of installation that you made in the market to to show to the market people the pictures that you had produced and the way they interact mm -hmm. yeah and of course i is, um, as yeah, as soon as i finished i think it was 2014 and i yeah i didn't want to i wanted to find a way to bring back all this kind of work i've done to the exactly to the to the to its source because I think there's sometimes in especially in the the art field is this kind of lack of, um, of connection in this case with the with the in this case with the community because I really I spent a long time I think three years of my life working with the with community with the material and I was really wanted to find the the a way to. Um, also to communicate my work to and to share the result of my of my research of my work that I, you know happened in the studio to the street and to the community so i um with the collaboration of a of a of a local gallery we um got a sponsorship from the art council and um i transform what is like a stall which you know the stall used by the uh, people from Ridley Road to sell their goods it was transformed and uh, into a sort of a portal exhibition so I selected a series of images and I print them in a, in a smaller format and uh, and so I, I for one month I Mm, you know, I live the, the, the market life daily, you know, you know, starting at 6 a.m. with my stall until the end of the, of the, of the day. And, um, 
and you know, of course, the result was incredible because at the, the beginning they thought I was, uh, uh, I mean, they didn't understand what I was doing there because they couldn't understand what kind of, what kind of product I was selling, especially when they discovered I was not even selling anything. It was, <laughs> I thought, but then, you know, they learned that's exactly what I wanted because then I started to, it was a really, it was a, a work of uh, communicating and trying now to explain what, you know, my, uh, temporary role there and to to show uh, what the, it was the result because of course you know after three years working there a lot of people they they knew me it was interesting how you know the the interaction and the different responses i got from the community because you know from uh, you know most of the people there are like people that are not, not interested in art or they even don't have the time to be interested in art so i think that the connection there was exactly through the subjects of the images so through the materials the the products that they sell every day and you know then i remember this um, um this mental me, I know, I never thought that actually you could make a sculpture out of a, of a yam. So, and exactly, I think that's uh, when the, the, the art of, of uh, the role of art starts to, to me to have a sense so to create these kind of bridges between, you know, different groups uh, of people, different communities. And, uh, and so it was, uh, I mean, it was a really interesting um, moment. And of course, you know, I got also some negative, uh, mm feedback there were also people you know that they didn't accept my uh, my role there you know was uh, i think that and that's exactly you know the, the dynamic of of a, of a free space or the you know of, of the street in this case mm. okay. and uh, yeah but you know it, uh, another thing that i do apart from the store was also to you know it was i i printed a series of posters and so i you know i used them just to hang them along all the the street of the of the market which is an easiest uh, you know it's quite an easy way to uh to bring back all these images and then to see also how they they are um perceived by the by the people but was you know it's, i think that the was mainly like a positive feedback because at the end you know you're really and that's why also i think that the images they're quite i mean they're uh, to me the aesthetic um, the form of each image is quite important i try to use this kind of uh, aesthetic language to exactly to create this this bridge and this uh, which is uh, a kind of dialogue with people we are now maybe connected to art and uh, and that was the idea of all the the, the performance that lasted for one month Mm. Great. Perhaps we could leave the. Uh, if people have questions, I don't know. Rafael, do you have? Do you see questions? Mm, no, not so far. But uh, I encourage people if they have questions, please do write them in the chat, and I will uh, pass them on. I, I had one question actually, um, Lorenzo. Um, I, I can't show it on on the screen, but. Um, you you have in the money must be made a few pieces which are textiles pieces like fabrics i can show them i think hold on if i go to his website hold on oh, just a second with all um with the writings on it um so we have one, we have one in the show yeah, there was another um, tentative and way to find uh, a contact with, the, in this case, with the subject, with the, and the people I uh, photograph, interview in the market. And because, of course, the, um, here there was a more uh, logistical problem because first, uh, yeah, here the, the Balogun market is, you know, as, as you've seen in the images, a really, I mean, the, the, the crowd is so intense uh, and so it's really difficult to you know it was quite impossible to do something similar that i did in uh, um, mm. in dalston so i i got this idea to instead to to print a series of, of books with all the like with a sort of a first presentation of the work and i started to show it like um to the people i was meeting to the people i was working and i was photographing and to to have here um again like a feedback and the feedback was happening in the in the time of the interview and um and so then that's why i decided then to use these kind of fragments of interviews to create like another series of artworks that then became part of the book and uh, and i work with a calligrapher mm -hmm. uh, from the market who you know exactly drew all these um 
phrases, fragments of discourses on the mostly Nigerian uh, fabrics, and then I rephotograph it. And um, and of course, you know, the, the, as you've seen, you know, Oibo, how far it means uh, white men, uh, where are you going? Because of course, as, as soon as it was walking into the market, we're all mm. screaming, Oibo, Oibo, in a really <laughs> ironic way. It was, uh, so it was in a way to, to bring also the voices of the, of the of the market in the book and that's why i always like to try to, to work with text and um here what is missing that i was and i wanted to to use was also the audio because it's really interesting all these different um the, the people you see here in the pictures of the portraits that are you know using their body as a as a shop because they're you know they maybe the that the people you know with the, just arrived maybe in Lagos, they are immigrants from the north who really find in the in the market the first uh, solution to the you know uh, live and to their life also they to and to, they find a, a job uh, quite easily. But it's really interesting how they invent you know different strategies to you know to connect to people and to sell the the goods. And for example, one of the strategies to use and create a, diff, a quite a like a, 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 a sound a noise which is really recognizable by the people in the market. So there is someone who is uh, and is incredible. I want to do like also to record and do, do the um, do a series of recordings to to use that in the exhibition and. Uh, but it never happened. But it's, you know, that was the idea also of the uh, of the text in the in the book. So Lorenzo, tell us why the the title "Money Bus Me Made." What there is a, is there a story behind it? Yeah, the story is that the, you know again I was uh, walking one morning in the market and I saw this um, guy um, wearing a t-shirt with this. Uh, tag like money must be made and I really I, you know, I was so curious because I, I, I love the t-shirt and I stopped him and I said ma tell me more about your t-shirt I mean is this beautiful say yeah this is uh, this is the Lagos motto and at the beginning was you know it can appear as a really strong yeah it's a strong sentence but it really gives and you have this kind of uh, two really strong verbs like you know must and made and is uh but really gives you the idea i mean from uh what i learned in you know in uh, living the uh, life of, of balog and also of legos in this kind of um, physical approach of making uh in this wealth and it's really and it applies a lot of creativity applies a lot of new strategies that are invented every day but to really physically make in this case money by this uh, money is not the point, but I really wanted, I thought it was really perfect to, to name the, the entire project. Okay, thank you. And uh, yeah. So. What happened? You're okay. We are looking for questions, but I think people are not asking questions. We have given some time uh, yeah. questions. Yeah. So if anyone has a question, it's now. Now. So I'm just waiting one or two minutes. And, um, of course. Because well, now we are in the, it's non-streaming, right, Rafael? How does it work? It's, uh, the, now it's, the questions are on the Zoom chat. Actually, you can see them also. So. Okay. Uh, uh, what would be the uh, um, a next step to move further with this uh, market uh, project? What would you, where would you like to go and what type of things? So you talk about audio, sound, what will be for you a next step uh, regarding this project? But at the moment, you know, it's, uh, it's, uh, I'm working on the uh, Caminante, so I'm really mm. putting all my energy and attention there. So it's uh, really, I mean, that's how I work. I really, really, I can, uh, it's difficult to me to um, switch. Exactly, you know, uh, man, they're not really good. I'm not really good in multitasking. So yeah. I have to switch. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> in one project and that's why I, and I really I got quite um, I put my all my energy and, and time there so at the moment I'm really uh, focused on um, 
developing caminantes. And, uh, and of course here, because it was, uh, Gideon, it was, um, there are two projects that really is, one is the continuation of the other. So at the end, it would be difficult to find the third the step to this, you know, the, the story of the, of the markets. But you know, to me, markets, they still is a, really is a subject that is still in, really important and is still intriguing, especially, I think it's quite, uh, has a lot of uh, potential and a lot of hidden, uh, layers to 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 discover still the the third step would be to because i thought about it so to go to china and to see exactly i mean because that would be the beginning of really of everything because you know it's um i'm really in a way following the products because in dolston i found the nigerian products i discover nigeria culture and then i know i you know, I, I continue in Nigeria and, and, and there, of course, I, I did Money Must Be Made. And of course, in Money Must Be Made, in, in Balogun, I found this kind of, uh, I found the Chinese uh, hyper production. So I think when it would be interesting to follow the process and go to where actually all these products are made. There is a question. Ah, uh, yeah. Do you, yeah, do you only work on, on your artistic projects or do you have also uh, commercial work? No, I do also commercial work. There are usually collaborations with, um, uh, yeah, companies or it depends of the, sometimes, most of the time, fashion uh, brands, because of course working a lot with textile and with fabrics, I have uh, I like to sometimes to experiment to accept uh, assignments is something that I, you know it's, uh, I never uh, in a way there is, there is a good collaboration there is you know there is I don't have to compromise too much my language I always I usually accept and, it's, uh, and sometimes it's I just finished quite a, it was it was a sort of a assignment but then at the end you know the final result was an exhibition that I did in. Uh, in Rome and uh, where I presented this work, which was Jugal Bandin. I collaborated with a, a, a weaving uh, uh, textile company who actually makes Indian rugs. So it was actually a really, mm. really good collaboration because it was, uh, it was, it was uh, yeah, it's actually also connected to my website, work. No? Hmm? It's also on your website, I, I think, no? You put it in my website. Yeah, 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 I put it in my website. And then, of course, you know, the final output was more, you know, it was actually a physical uh, arazzo or a rack, but it was, um, if you see, I mean, it was an assignment, but it was, in a way, it was also like a um, personal project was because it was so connected to my practice. It was a really, uh, yeah, an ideal uh, assignment. So it was, uh, and actually I learned a lot from, you know, the, from the job. Mm -hmm. And it's also, um, I guess, a, a, a framework, the commercial uh, assignments where you explore also the sculptural aspect and the installations uh, that, um, that are also at stage in your personal work. But uh, I have in mind a few commissions that you made where you also have a great deal of uh, set design and installation, right? Yeah, yeah, actually, usually, yes, I mean, and especially the last years and the last period I've been um, mainly working with installation works and uh, sculpture and, uh, and and set design so it was actually I, yeah, I and that's exactly why I really love because it's a really um, even if course it's a there are assignments but they it's a really um, an opportunity to discover and to um, experiment experiment really and uh, and of course there is uh, I don't have to I mean there is a an economic, um, let me say, I mean, of course the brands have, there is a possibility to really, you know, in this case, to work in a, in a big scale. And this is something that, you know, it's always, it was a, it's good as an experiment because also then to, to bring back to my practice. So it's something that I never, I think is uh, quite, uh, I was happy to do. Mm. Okay. Okay. There's no more questions. So um, I mean, I uh, I hope that uh, that the two talks uh, enabled to see. I mean, that was also one of the 
aim of the show here where we show the three series of, uh, of yours, Lorenzo, to, to see how much your work is uh, rooted into these topics of uh, circulation, hybridation, which are at stage both in the series which are located in, in these two markets, but also in the more recent uh, Caminantes projects. So I think that this, this pass, of course, uh, I mean, the, the stylistic translation might be a bit different from one project to another, but there's a, this common thread which is really, um, really strong and which makes uh, us always uh, super curious of the next, uh, of the <laughs> next step. <laughs> oh, thank you. It's a shame that he still couldn't be there physically. I mean, we will make it once because it was a really shame that he could be also today to be there and we do yeah. do a, in a normal way. But we, yeah, I hope I'm happy that, you know, it's a, we managed to, to, how do you say, to postpone the, 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 the show until the 23rd, right? Of January. Yeah. yeah. Yes. That's the good... Um, it's a good news. news. Because yeah. you managed to open the museum on the, after the 15th, right? Of yeah, the December, December 15th, yeah, if everything goes well. TBC to be confirmed. Yeah. Ah, really? So it's because not... Because we're waiting for the numbers to reach 5,000 cases, and until now we are not. <laughs> All right. So the government wants us to have 5,000 ca cases per day, and we are in a plateau. Well, any, any announcement so far is always... TBC. <laughs> to be confirmed. Yeah, it's the, the, the TBC future. I see TBC. I believe in yeah. precarious times. Mm. Bye bye. Uh, thank you to everyone. Thank you, Natalia. Thank you, Rafael. It was really, it was, uh, really good to, you know, to have this. Uh, it was really good to have you know, my work seen from these different angles. And I think it was, uh, it was really interesting to me, first of all. And I uh, thank you. Well, thank you. Thanks to thanks to you all all three of you, it was really um, a pleasure. Even though we didn't meet physically, uh, I hope we we still managed to do a, a good conversation. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Rafael, Sophia, and everyone. Uh, it was nice seeing you. Take care, Lorenzo, with the water. Thank you, Natalia. <laughs> Ciao. 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 Thank you, everyone, and see you soon. Bye bye. Thank bye -bye. you. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye, Sophie. How to continue the conversation? Thank you. Bye. Merci. Bye bye.